Hi, I'm Alex Archbull, and I've been buying and selling antiques since I was nine years old. From basements to scrapyards, I'll look just about anywhere I can to find lost antiques and collectibles. And sometimes I'll go big and buy everything. With my wife and kids, we run an antique shop in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, filled with some of the most unique items we can find. I never know what's going to happen or who I'm going to meet. This is our life, this is our adventure, and this is Curiosity Inc. From home, honey. Okay, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Where am I almost? At my friend's place. We are headed out, my friend Dale and I, today. He's another collector. I've known him for probably close to 17, 18 years, I guess, now. Wonderful human being, one of the best people. Um, we're gonna hang out together and go visit a collection. He's taking me out to an airplane hangar. Um, if there's a big, <laughs> hopefully I didn't annoy him at some point. He's taking me out to a field and leaving me there. <laughs> Uh, no, he's taking me out to look at a collection and um, I don't know what he's got. I know he's into the same kind of stuff I'm into when it comes to old cars and motorcycles, mainly like big stuff. Um, so I'm kind of excited to see what there is. I don't know if we're gonna take my truck or his, either way, I guess we'll figure it out. Um, guarantee his is better on gas than mine. This thing is a gas hog. I just filled up the other day and it's already run a little low. Mind you, it does have a small gas tank. <laughs> anyway, why am I complaining about gas? I've got to get to his place and um, and hit the road here. So let's head out, go on adventure, and uh, let's go meet Dale. I'm gonna have to take the old girl in for a car wash or truck wash soon. I've been keeping it pretty clean because I don't want to get any rust. This is a rust-free truck. I got to keep it that way. And even on newer vehicles, slightly newer ones, they even start to rust out. This vehicle's only what six, seven years old, and it's starting to get rust. And here we've got you know a 1976 with no rust. Normally they go in this back area. Before uh, winter set in, I wash it all out and I put a uh, protectant wax on the inside. So although I'm driving this vehicle in not the greatest weather, I am washing it regularly and I did uh, undercoat and protect it before winter. So hopefully I should be just fine before we go. But enough of that. Oh, here is Dale. Hi guys. <laughs> Dale, you helped me pull a truck out of the bush. Uh, the one that Jason and I fixed up. You've come on a few adventures with us. That's right. We've had a lot of fun together. Yeah, and I was thinking it's been, what, like 18 years or something like that that we've known each other? Yeah, since you had the store out at the uh, uh, West Edmonton Mall. That's right. Yeah. Is that your cell phone ring? That's my cell phone ringing. Let's just see who that is. Okay, I'll let you pick that up, and then I want to hear what you're doing with the car here. Okay, so you are not afraid to tear into a project. Well, no, I've been a mechanic all my life, um, mostly aircraft, but I've always restored cars and motorcycles, uh, way too many. You started off at, was it British Motor? You worked on Leland and British MGs and stuff? Yeah, and... when I was a teenager, uh, between going to college, uh, taking my aeronautics degree, um, I did uh, work for GB Motors, which was the British Leyland dealer in Edmonton. 109th Street, right next to what used to be the Rat Hole. So you would have had everything from so MGs to E-Type Jags? Rolls Royce to Jaguar to Rovers to MGs, Triumphs, um, Morrises, uh, Minis, everything. And has that knowledge, uh, is it still in the old memory banks working on that stuff? A lot of it is. A lot of, I don't know if it's useless information, but yeah, there's a lot of information in there. Well, it doesn't look like it's useless because what is going on here? What, what are you working on? Well, I'm working on uh, an Audi A4. This is my wife's car. But you were just driving this like, I just saw you last month and you were driving this car. Well, you probably mistaked it for the S4. We have an S4 Audi as well. Oh, okay. And um, this one, the rear timing chain broke while it was sitting idling at my wife's friends. Oh no. So I've overhauled the bottom end of the engine already and I'm just finishing the top end. And there's the head right there which is all overhauled i've just installed the camshafts and this is just a timing uh, block that you use and this is where that rear chain goes is right here and then we put the head on so do you do the machining yourself or do you send that out to a head no shop? no the head i sent to the cylinder head shop uh, in uh, west end yeah because you don't want any warpage or anything no i wish <laughs> i had that kind of machinery but you can see i don't have the space yeah for you're it. a little cramped for space and we were talking i was trying to convince you you should buy an acreage by me 
Yeah, well, and th that may come true. Okay, that I'd may come for true. It. You may have me as a neighbor. Is now is this my old bike? Is that one that I sold? Yes, you? yes, yes. I yes. recognize it. This is the Triumph, which on this one I've gone, I've converted it to electronic ignition, and I'm just putting different uh, lights on it. Okay, yeah. These uh, see, you got these little hat section lights that kind of go with the the head. Oh, the the yeah. hooded sort of. Uh... But uh, the Audi kind of diverted me on it. Um, I've got the motorcycle lift that it sits on. Right, and yeah. you can see this stuff back here. Um, remember when we were doing the hoarder's house? Oh, is that stuff that came that's, out of the basement? That's the lathe and that's the milling machine. Oh, okay, from uh, Betty Jones Place. Yes, yes. Hey, well, that's pretty good that you've got them set up. And uh, have you been using them at all? Yeah, yeah. I had to, I, you know, I had to buy a few more parts not to get them to, to work, which was no big deal. It was all very easy. And then I've got a little sheet metal brake and the bandsaw and just lots of stuff. What a what a great backdrop to work on your metalwork. You got the Beatles Abbey Road there. Oh, <laughs> just don't don't do uh, metalwork barefoot like uh, like Paul McCartney. Oh yeah, well I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah, that was a big myth that he. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I won't play any records backward and hear that Dale is deceased or something. <laughs> well, you ready to hit the road? Yes, I, let's go and go to the airport. Okay. Well, I, I guess uh, I won't take up too much of your time because it looks like you have a car to reassemble here at some point. But it looks like it's just about done though. Okay. Well, it's on the last, it's going together, so that's the good part. And one of the last things I'm going to do is overhaul the turbocharger that sits right here. And the turbocharger was passing oil, so Audi wants $3,000 for a turbocharger. I bought an overhaul kit for $55. And you're going to do it yourself? And I'm going to do it myself, and it's just sitting on the ground down there. Wow. Dale's workshop. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a big savings right there, 55 versus a few grand. Oh, yeah. Well, this will be nice to see it all done, but I'm really excited to see what you have in store for me this afternoon because we're going somewhere I've never been. Well, and that, so then we're going to have some fun. We're going to show you some airplanes and stuff that's lying around and the surplus stuff. I don't know if it's surplus stuff you're interested in. Oh, you but, never know. Well, you know, big fuel trucks and things okay. like that. Okay, well, let's go for a ride. Okay. Okay, we've arrived. Um, we're going to go into an undisclosed hangar, um, a storage building, a unit full of stuff, and I am excited to go and see what's in there. Um, Dale's just an interesting guy. He's not here right now. <laughs> I tilt the camera over and Dale's sitting there next to me like, what are you talking about me like I'm not here? Anyway, he's a great guy. I'm really curious to see what he's got. This is gonna be an exciting day. Well, this is definitely one of my stranger places to go picking. <laughs> There's like passenger jet planes in a big hangar. Don't know where we're headed to. This isn't my usual barn or attic full of stuff. I'm not used to just seeing a bunch of planes hanging around. So there are some massive aircraft in here. And you said this is a British Aerospace, is it an RJ? Yeah, British Aerospace RJ aircraft. Okay, and you were telling me, okay, what is what was the price of this airplane brand new? Well, they were around the 30 to 35 million back in the day in the, say the 1980s late 70s yeah when they were the originally the 146 which was the analog aircraft these are the new improved version which is the rj which is the digital um modern aircraft and so what's the uh, what's the used airplane lot sale price on a plane like well this? um they range anywhere from say a couple of million up to as high as maybe eight million if you were i know of a corporate one that's in kazakhstan that is going for eight million, but that's got gold fixtures and it's all very executive. So if you had a million bucks, you could buy something like this possibly? A couple of million dollars, you're into one of these. Yes. Well, that's a bargain considering it was 30 originally. I thought depreciation was bad on a Bentley or a Rolls, but I talk about depreciation on an airplane. Oh, airplane is, it's massive, the depreciation, but the problem is maintaining them once you own it. That's the expense. Yeah, the, keeping the guys on the clock, fixing your engine well, and stuff. Well, every part of an aircraft is a controlled part. It's controlled by you know the regulatory agencies and the certification. So that's your expense is the paperwork and certification and keeping to the approved schedule of maintenance with the aircraft. Mm. That's the expense. That sounds like a lot of work. Well, and you kind of like to keep it inside in a nice hangar. So that's another expense and yeah. And here I thought we'd be walking out with a bargain on this. <laughs> Listen, I've got a, I got $100 cash in my pocket today. <laughs> well, no, no. <laughs> you don't you think can... that's not going to get me this airplane? Ah, oh, I guess Melissa's safe. This is what I get for having it. Just because I have an acreage now doesn't mean that I'm suddenly going to start. Mind you, that'd be a 
a great guest suite. You know, take the wings off, and you can have little bedrooms in there. Well, I it's mean, practical. Here, here's the thing that will really boggle your mind. See the hangar that we're in right now, and the hangars that are, you know, one big, big hangar yeah, that's yeah. behind us. When they were went up for sale, when the previous company uh, moved away, these hangars were sold for like a dollar. Oh. But uh. the reason for that was is that the maintenance and the upkeep of the hangars is the actual expense. Right, and then you're paying taxes on it and all well, that. Well, and, and you don't own the land. You only own the building because the land is federally, this is federal land that is controlled by the airport authority, which is a private company. And so the land, you never own the land. So I guess my $100 cash could have not just bought me the airplane, but all the buildings that they are housed in. Well, if you know the right people at the right if time. if you want to pay the quarter million dollars um, uh, a month um, for the up no no i'm good <laughs> but as we're looking around here i see a pile of stuff uh and you've got some things stashed in here so let's check out and see what let's you got look at that piper cub tandem i've flown a cessna that wasn't that was a little bigger than this actually the cessnas are a bit bigger than a piper right oh yeah yeah and you were probably in a, in a, tr a tricycle uh, configuration where it had a nose wheel instead of a tail wheel uh, yeah it had yeah. a nose wheel and we had the uh the door was below the wing because yeah. we could clip the side door i would i Got to fly it a bit, which was fun. And then I had to take photos out the side. So they opened up the side door and I hung out and they went on an angle and I took pictures all the way along. It was great. <laughs> so this is a project that your friend's working on. Yeah, this is his own pr uh, personal aircraft that he brought down south uh, to get some work done uh, down here. So what's something like a, a Piper once it's well, restored? Well, this is basically a Piper, a Ronca. Um, they're all kind of the same sort of size aircraft, kind of a, a what they call a puddle jumper, just a slow and slow aircraft. Probably fun though. Um, you know, you can get them for say, uh, say an Aronka Champ for maybe thirty thousand dollars, but the Piper Cubs are hugely uh, collectible, and you can see them going up in the neighborhoods of even as high as a hundred thousand dollars. Really? So what year? if it was a Super Cub. What year would this be from? I'm going to guess that... Uh, like 50s, 60s? Well, yeah. They, I mean, they started building them in the you know, late 40s and, all, and actually even in, the, in, in the World War II, there, some of the early versions of this were in as uh, bird dog aircraft where they flew around. And, right. And I see you, when you look at the controls, it looks like... Now I can see why you transitioned from working on MGs to working on airplanes. Look, the technology is like the same. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, like cable reels and you know this is what's keeping you alive flying in the sky is this thin little box <laughs> well and you know an aircraft like this you're in the sky say your engine quits this thing glides really well right yeah uh, you just hope that you've got a place that you can put it down in and you don't need much of an airfield to land this in no this in a is piece a of, piece of grass you know 500,000 feet long you've you've got uh, no problem landing it Right. So it, it cruises at, say, about 85, 90 miles an hour, and your landing speed is, say, 35, 40 knots uh, if you want to you know, do a stall landing. And it's not long. It's like it's the length of a 60s Chrysler, yeah. basically. It's not a... And the wingspan, you know, the wings would go out to about here on right. each side. Yeah, okay. It was so darn right practical. They're a low and slow aircraft. But they'll get you there. And there's a random motorcycle, the Yamaha sitting over there. Yeah, that's one of mine. Is that one of yours? Yeah. I should have known if it was if it had two wheels, it was probably one of yours. It's a XS uh, 650. About uh, I think it's a 1980. I just got that. A friend of mine gave it to me. Well, I was gonna say that looks like that you shouldn't have paid a whole lot for Yamahas well, like it that. Had or... a, it had a fire right there. Oh, I see. So right I got a little box. bit of problems with the wiring, but what it was is the left carburetor, I guess, backfired and things caught fire. And... Oh, that would have been a... I bet he got off of that thing in a hurry. Because <laughs> 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 that seat's burnt up pretty good, too. It yeah. would have been the... Let's hope you had your leather shaps on so that you weren't uh, running around with your denim on fire. But but it's a, it's a good future project. My brother owned one of these back in the day, so that's why I was really interested in getting it. Oh, okay. And Sentimental reasons. If I restore it, uh, he may end up with it. Oh, well, okay. So, so this is the, the rudder, right? Yes. And you were saying that on the early aircraft, it, had, uh, it was wrapped in sort of like, was it a heavy canvas or cloth? 
No, it was cloth. It was what we called grade A fabric uh, covering and all the early aircraft, like back, you know, the Wright brothers and yep. all that sort of stuff. Uh, right up until, you know, even some lot of aircraft and small aircraft that are made today are used fabric. Now fabric back in those days was a cloth and you used a, a doping uh, compound that would shrink the cloth and create, um, uh, you know, a good strong surface. And that was the factory name of that product was dope? Yep. Okay. Yep. And so you were saying that that's where the expression doped up comes from. Well, when you're doing that kind of work, you want to be in a well-ventilated area because, you know, all those fumes, uh, yeah, you can get pretty dopey and pretty drugged up. Right. So It's the wrong kind of high that you want to be when you're working on aircraft. You want to be up in the sky flying around, not <laughs> Well, and back fumes. in the early days, they, they tended to use women for doing this kind of work because there was a lot of lacing and sewing. And so they got to experience a lot of that um, personally. And, and it's all very detailed work. So... Uh, it doesn't mean that guys didn't do it, but there was just a lot of women that do it. Now, well, the fabrics have improved since the, the old days. Now we're into, you know, things like Seconite and and a lot of those fabrics now, you lay it on and you use an iron, like for ironing your yep. clothes, to iron. To the, get this sort of nice tight tension, finish. To get the tension and then you lay some. Well, luckily things have changed a lot. Like they don't lick the brushes for putting <laughs> uranium on got dials and gauges anymore either but true some things change for better but that's a cool piece of history yeah and that uh, has a, an air starter well this is definitely unusual this is a about a 1968 turbine aircraft starter yes. like a and so you got the batteries hooked up and you picked this up in the north the, the great white north you said yellow knife or yes. something yeah yellow knife. brought it back and well you think it's actually going to start Oh yeah, I won't fully start it in here because we should really take it out. I don't want to sit off the fire. Well, no, system. yeah, we don't want to do but that. But we can show you what happens. And what it is, this hose back here, that's where it takes air from the turbine once it's running. And that air is plugged into an aircraft that you're starting. And that air is used to, for the air starter to start a jet engine. And it's a turbine that, that gives you 500 horsepower at the shaft. Well, yeah, it's approximately about 500 shaft horsepower. The thrust out of these things is not anything to be uh, too, you know, useful, but it does give you a lot of shaft horsepower. And what you told me is that you picked this up not to use for starting aircraft, but you and your friend are trying to invent a type of biofuel that's really easy to make, and you're testing that biofuel on this engine yeah, to we've see tested, the turbine. we've tested our biofuel on diesel engines, and we've got that perfected. Now our next step is to do it on turbine engines. Wow. That's, so. that's crazy. So I guess this will be a test, uh, a cheap way to effectively test it. So is it running on biofuel right now or not yet? No, no. I've got uh, Jet A fuel in there right now. So okay. it's standard jet fuel. So you're priming it? Yeah, I just turned the master switch on. You can, you can hear the fuel pump. Yeah. <laughs> that's... So that's just a sample. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds just like an airplane starting up. If you wanted, I could drag it outside. Oh, no, no, no. We don't have to drag it outside. You. I'm not going to make you do that today. But how cool is that? Not many people have their own 500 horse turbine. <laughs> we should put it in an old, like, MG Midget and go drive it oh, around. Oh, gosh, that would be fast. <laughs> well, they, they made a Ford turbine, didn't they? Well, the thing about these turbines is they're not throttleable. They're a constant speed turbine. Oh. So, but you could use that with a with an automatic transmission to a certain extent so that you could, you know, adjust sort of a wobble plate to give that. So this thing would turn at a standard uh, RPM and then you'd adjust that through a transmission to give you power. But yeah, it would go like stink. Well, it sounds like you've got it all figured out. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's do let's it. Put some, let's strap some seats to the top of this thing and go ripping around the airfield here. Oh boy. Well, that's cool. Thanks for showing me. Oh, no problem. Instrument lights are always in the middle. Well, I guess I'll get my crash course on uh, flying today. Well, here we yeah. go. I guess we'll get the hangar doors opened up and we'll take her out for a little spin. Just Throttles are always round knobs oh, so yeah. that you can feel what you're touching. The flaps are in the shape of an airfoil. Okay, so you know what you're looking at. I didn't you realize know what it was you're like touching. That. The landing gear selector knob right there yep. is actually a wheel. It's even got rid of the landing gear selector. Oh yeah, it looks like the landing gear looks like a looks wheel. Like a wheel. Oh, okay. So uh, really, a child or someone who acts like a child could learn to fly. No, there's a lot of other gauges and buttons and things to know. It's... But it's it's all in a logical order. It seems like a lot. These are your 
flight management computers, but everything's in dual. So what you have over there is on this side. So the, the pilot, those instruments are duplicated for the first officer or for the co-pilot. His, the, uh, the captain's computer, flight management computer, the co-pilot's flight management. Pretty cool. I feel like I'm inside like a, I don't know, like some kind of, it feels almost like a sports car. The way the, the, the roof is fairly low and you've got this angular. This is like the, you know, the Lamborghini of the sky. Well, maybe not. <laughs> it's well, a passenger you try to plane. Make the cockpit so you wear it. It's kind of fun. Ah, it's kind of neat. I could, I could see getting into this. Oh, that's really cool. No test flight for me today, but pretty neat to sit in the, the captain's seat here. I'll, I'll have to get myself a captain's hat now. That's really neat. Now there are some actual things for sale out here too. All of this is surplus. Tanker trucks, conveyor belts. There's been moments where I've been clearing out houses and needed a conveyor belt system like that. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of excess, but well, man. you said you like these tractors. Here's one for the one with a cab, one without a cab. Okay, and so what is a little uh, Stuart Stevenson uh, airplane tug selling for? You can probably talk them out of it for about 30 grand. 30 grand. They paid probably 90 for them. Well, what, it's a bargain. Yeah. 90,000 bucks is what these things sell for new. Well, it's got some... This looks like I could, you could build a Mad Max vehicle out of this thing and just and go... A lot of Mad Max stuff was made out of airport services. Was it really? Okay, that's my first thought is like how insane these big wheels are and stuff. I mean, I can't even imagine what this tire is worth. That's probably like a thousand dollar tire. Oh, way more than that. Really? Okay. Yeah, way more so, than that. I would say it's more about a $3,500 tire. Really? So that basically you're buying it for the value of the tires on this thing. That's a, it's a pretty cool unit. I mean, I don't know what the heck I'd do with it. I'd rather, if I'm, I mean, if I'm picky, I'd rather have the one with the enclosed cab that I could take the kids to school in it. <laughs> you just want to make sure whatever you're riding on has got a hard surface. So it'll just drop through oh, I bet. the mud just like a... Well, I can see it sinking into the concrete. Like the concrete, the asphalt's being pushed in from the weight of these things. And tanker trucks. Cool trucks. These yeah. are all decertified fuel trucks. It can't be used for them again. It can't be used for fuel ever again. Not for aircraft fueling. Can I just fill them up with jello and be the jello man? Yep. I'll have music ringing in the background. Yep. <laughs> Might taste a little off. <laughs> <laughs> Come and get your jello, kids. We're all loaded up. Just don't bring that cigarette near me because you might have a bit of a mishap. Well, it's a pretty cool trip. Lots of neat surplus stuff, lots of things. I don't know that I'll be buying an aircraft or a tug or a, uh, oh, come on. a tanker truck today. <laughs> we've, we've, we've teased you enough that you probably would buy a Piper Cub. Uh, possibly. Um, or fill a uh, old fuel truck full of jello. So maybe I shouldn't say these things. I'll never end up being able to get approved for my food handling uh, certificate. I'm joking. <laughs> Uh, but there are a couple sea cans around, and we were thinking I might have use for a sea can out of the acreage. Um, well, that's so, a 40 footer. Yeah, which might be handy. So you never know what we're going to end up with. It was a fun adventure and uh, fun. Got to sit in the cockpit of an airplane, learn a little about aircraft, and uh, just generally had a good day. So thanks very much for watching today's episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you all soon, and bye. <laughs>